Hello and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership podcast series now in our well over 180th episode. My name is Scott Miller and I am privileged each week to be able to absorb some of the greatest insights, leadership tips, business strategies from the world's greatest minds. And in the first year of our series, I realized quickly that so many of these insights that were either taped in the interview or perhaps sometimes off camera were of enormous value to our listeners and viewers around the world that I published a book called Master Mentors from HarperCollins, 30 Transformative Insights from Your Greatest Minds, where I feature a single insight from 30 of our first 100 guests. Pick up a copy of Master Mentors to take the podcast to even a different level, and pretty soon we'll be publishing Master Mentors Volume 2, featuring 30 new guests, all the way up to what I think will be probably 10 volumes in this multi-year series. Now today it is an enormous honor to have an author of a gentleman who I've been following for over 25 years from his first book around the topic of loyalty, The Loyalty Effect. Fred Reicheld has joined us today to talk about a new release coming out in December called Winning on Purpose, a follow-up to the world-renowned books that he wrote called The Ultimate Question and the re-released Ultimate Question 2. He is, of course, the founder, the inventor of the Net Promoter Score, a 44 plus year veteran and now sort of fellow, a fellow emeritus with the Bain uh, Group, Bain Company, Fred Reicheld, welcome to On Leadership. Thank you, Scott, good to be here. It's rare do you have a chance to introduce someone that's had a 44 year career. Uh, you are, of course, the uh, practice leader of Bain's loyalty practice. You are a, a well-renowned author, speaker, coach. <laughs> You have been an advisor to the Franklin Covey Company for several decades. Of course, our chairman, Bob Whitman, and you are longtime friends. And our colleague, Sandy Rogers, served as the leader of Franklin Covey's loyalty practice for a decade plus and has had the opportunity to take the net promoter score into thousands of clients around the world. Today, you're here for kind of the, the, the insights into what you've learned over 40 years around customer loyalty. Fred, you opened the book talking very vulnerably about a significant health scare that you have had and you are managing right now. Can you talk a little bit about your own journey in the 40 plus years you've worked with the Bain Company and really what was the genesis for you to write this new book, Winning on Purpose, as your own health began to kind of focus and, and pressurize your clarity on this topic? Yeah, I got a cancer diagnosis uh, a little over five years ago that life-threatening and uh, we've been able to manage that, but it, it gave me time. You know, those those chemo and radiation sessions, <laughs> you're thinking about what do you really want to get done in the life you have left. Um, it became clear that I needed to write another book. Even though I've written on this same subject for over 25 years, I've learned so much more in the past decade and I've actually understood how it's, it's, it's not just customer or employee loyalty, it's really uh, insights about the core purpose of an organization and how great leaders build great communities, great organizations. In fact, Fred, you write that there is really only one core purpose for every organization, and many pay lip service to that, but those that really align their behaviors, their strategies, their processes, their systems, their hiring, those are the ones that separate. Remind us what the core purpose, in your opinion, should be for every organization. Well, I, what I'm shocked by is when we survey senior executives around the world, we ask, what's the primary purpose of your organization? The vast majority will say uh, it's either to be a great place to work or it's a balanced duty to all of our stakeholders, when in fact, I think the only winning purpose is to put customers first, that to enrich customers' lives is the, the integrating purpose that lets you do all the good things for your other stakeholders. So I'm hoping this book, will get people refocused that the only way to make your employees inspired and fired up to, to fight the fight is to put them in a position to enrich the lives they touch, the enrich the lives of customers, because it's, it's customers that make people happy, not their bosses. And the bosses put them in a position to earn that happiness by delighting customers. So Fred, we'll have a chance to revisit that topic throughout this interview. Let's kind of level set. You literally are the inventor of the world-renowned process known as NPS, the Net Promoter Score. Would you set a little bit of context for what that means, 
Uh, maybe give us a minute or two primer on the scale, how companies have adopted it. Many, of course, not perhaps to your you know, pleasure and, and, and reap the benefits that you think they could have. Give us a reorientation to NPS. Well, I've come to the understanding that the, the most fundamental rule in life is the golden rule, to love thy neighbor as thyself. Um, we don't measure that very well in business. You know, accounting and financials help us measure how many, you know, when we've extracted a million dollars from our customers' wallets, it doesn't tell us when we've enriched a million lives, when we have helped our employees find lives of meaning and purpose through, through the work that, that does enrich lives. And I believe it's important to measure those things and to build those into a science if they're going to be front and center. So Net Promoter was my effort at let's get a simple metric that helps you know of all the lives you've touched, how many are enriched, how many diminished. And in that promoter language, that's how many promoters I've created, how many detractors. But the core idea is um, building a lifetime balance sheet of enriching the lives you touch and having a science around it to learn how to get better. And of course, net promoter isn't just how likely is it to recommend us to a friend, zero through 10. It is a follow-up question about why and how, how I can improve. So it starts a conversation that's focused around the core purpose of, I think, a good person, a good team, a good business, which is to enrich the lives I touch. And when I fail, I want to know that and get better. Fred, it is nearly impossible now to not engage in NPS, whether you are buying a car, renting a car, whether you are uh, staying at a resort somewhere where you'll now get the question, whether it is attributed to NPS or otherwise, you know, how is your experience on a scale of one to 10 and how likely are you to recommend us, uh, countless tens of thousands of organizations have adopted NPS, whether it be through your own work or that through the Franklin Covey company that's worked with you over the last plus decade. Those organizations that are getting it right, that have implemented the quote NPS system in their organization, what separates them from the countless thousands that are attempting it but perhaps failing at it? Well, it's, it, it's in some ways a wonderful success that uh, Bain and great partners like Franklin Covey and, and others have spread this net promoter idea. I saw in Fortune magazine that uh, over two thirds of the large companies in the world now use net promoter, which would make it makes me proud, I suppose. But most of them are using it very badly and misusing it, even abusing it. So I hope I, I can clarify that not just in in my book and in this webcast, but but everywhere, the spirit of net promoter is to enrich the lives you touch. And so this idea of getting feedback on that is vital. Never link that to a person's bonus or their promotability because then you turn it in, you turn a, an inspiring metric, learning how to enrich lives into a target that affects people's job and their bonus. So they care more about the score than they do about learning from the feedback how to, how to love their customers better. You know, go to a typical car dealer, and yes, they, they ask that question, how likely to recommend to a friend, but then they follow up with, and remember, at our company, only a 10 is a passing grade. Or if, if there's any reason you can't give us a 10, let us know what we need to do to, to get you to a 10, you know, like free car mats or free oil changes. And this bribing and pleading and manipulating has turned a, a really good tool into a joke. And I, I hope we can get that fixed. Yeah, I've been on the receiving end of that many of times, whether it be from some kind of car service to, I was at a bagel store, a national bagel chain recently, where this uh, a junior associate at the front counter sort of circled the receipt and pleaded with me with this un un unnatural eye contact about how important it is that she get a 10. And, and I was thinking of you and of course my colleague, our friend Sandy Rogers, who leads our loyalty practice. Uh, so you're right, it certainly has been abused probably through ignorance, not through you know, malicious intent. Uh, no, it's well intentioned. It, it's you know, it's it's. I want my, to hold my people accountable to this net promoter idea, and it's an important idea. But what they don't understand, and I guess I didn't understand at the beginning, when you hold people accountable to a survey score, a survey based score, and it's the person that's face to face with you who you're holding accountable to that, it destroys the ability to learn, and and you get customers recognizing. This guy doesn't care about me, the customer. He or she just cares about the score. It's selfish. And the whole thing about the golden rule is it generous. I succeed in my life when I make you happy. That's a pretty darn good philosophy of life. And that's what's behind that promoter done right. 
In fact, to those millions of business unit leaders watching and listening to this throughout the world, if you have also struggled with how to find the right balance, you know, winning on purpose is a great, it's a great kind of download of all of your research and insights and your own maturity, right, on how best to uh, win uh, customers' loyalty. Fred, of the thousands of organizations you personally have coached, mentored, spoken to, written about, three you sort of elevate in the book and in your own work from being uh, obviously one of the genesis of your thinking around NPS, which of course is Enterprise rent a with the founder and owner, Andy Taylor. You talk also about USAA, the insurance company. I think the former, maybe joint chiefs of cha staff, vice chairman that was the CEO of that. And then you end with a story about um, Chick-fil-A and the founder, Truett Cathy, and one of the three of those organizations doing right. Would you take as much time as needed and share with our listeners and viewers, what are the insights that you took from Enterprise, USAA, and Chick-fil-A that has also sophisticated your own thinking around putting customers first? Yeah, after a cancer diagnosis and not knowing, they talk about survival curves, how many people in your condition are going to be alive in two years and in five years. It, it makes you think, wow, what got me to where I am today and what I believe what I believe in? And it was uh, it was a handful of leaders. I stepped I shouldn't just say it's these three because Scott Cook at Intuit, uh, Jack Bogle at Vanguard, but there were, there were three, I guess, that stand above the others. And Andy Taylor is one of them. He, he built a business uh, from a little leasing, a family leasing company in St. Louis to become the largest car rental company on earth. And I, I interviewed him uh, and, and asked him, what's, tried to get at, what's the magic behind this? This is a capital intensive business and you're still a private company. How'd you raise... This, how did you build this amazing success story? And he says, Fred, it, there are no tricks here. There's only one way to grow a, a great business. You treat your customers so they come back for more and bring their friends. And that simple idea changed my life because that's what Net Promoter tries to measure. It doesn't do it perfectly. And that's why we've developed earned growth rate, which really is an accounting measure of how much of your growth is coming from customers returning and bringing their friends. But it was that Andy Taylor example and, and he was the guy, if you were to say, where did Net Promoter come from? I saw Andy Taylor doing something similar at Enterprise Rent-A-Car and making it a, not a market research effort, but a core part of the management process and how powerful that could be and how he thought of himself as a leader whose job, his job wasn't to enrich customers' lives. His job was to help his employees, his team succeed. And the way they would succeed is by embracing a mission of enriching the customers they touched. And that chain reaction I learned from Andy. I was just, I've been in touch with him on this book and, and reconnecting, and he continues to be just an outstanding guy. How did an enterprise become great? Not through brilliant marketing advertising, but through brilliant insight about how you build a business, how you treat people right. I saw similar things at USAA in a totally different business. You know, USAA serves military and their families, alumni, um, veterans. And Bob Harries, who was the fellow running the company when I got to know it, Harry's learned about my work on loyalty and was incredibly generous. You know, not keep secrets uh, or don't tell Fred anything. I don't want my competitors to know. He was just very open and, and, and he taught me about loyalty. I'd never been in the military, but he'd obviously had a whole career. He was vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, but started out the uh, Naval Academy, worked his way through the ranks. And so he thinks of loyalty to your troops, great generals. They care about their troops' safety, that they, they're on the right mission. They understand that mission and they have the tools to succeed. But then the general's job is to take care of them, to care for their uh, health and well-being, mental health. Um, and he also taught me that loyalty, so, so loyalty is to your troops. And, and when people say, oh, employee loyalty, customer loyalty are hard to tease apart, you're absolutely right. They are connected. But it goes like this. The leader cares about their team. And if he truly loves his team or her team, they help them, in, they inspire that team to embrace a mission of service to customer, of enriching lives. And that then creates a, a success. And, and, and Bob Harry's I.O. for you know, why did you help me, Bob? I didn't ask him, I asked his secretary. I said, Harry is so generous with me. I mean, at that point, we didn't work with USAA. Um, he didn't know me from Adam, but he 
has his secretary explained when he finds someone who's who he thinks their life's work is is going to make the world better he invests in that relationship that's loyalty to him it's investing in relationships it's taking your time your energy your reputation and trying to make that relationship succeed and and by so doing spreading your principles through those uh through those relationship partners and i just saw how he made a difference in my life and i've tried to do that with others when i find an organization that is making the world better for others i try to make sure their story is well known and i try to help them succeed maybe the the last story is is the most oddball in my case um uh the founder of true founder of chick-fil-a truett kathy who i had a chance to get to know i helped their that company through their leadership transition as truett was retiring and um he invited me to his place uh outside of atlanta and we baked you know cooked waffles in the morning and got to know me and took me on a, a drive through uh the foster homes that he he supported and we got into life philosophy and and uh he said you know fred we at southern baptist and and talk about miles apart i'm a unitarian liberal libertarian in social things not so much in economic things and and he was a southern baptist he, he had a biblical quote on his windshield or you know he says his life's mission is this proverb from the bible he said that's sort of a standard thing for southern baptist families and his was proverbs 22 uh, is it, 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 a good name is to be desired more than uh, gold or silver so your reputation is everything and i thought boy that is that is so core. And, and I was a little, it was an awkward initial conversation because they have a, a Chick-fil-A has, has gotten a, a, a reputation for not loving thy neighbor in terms of gays. And uh, I have four children, two of whom are married and gay and proud, and I'm deeply proud of them. And so I thought, hmm, this tension could really get in the way of a productive uh, ride here. And, and it didn't, because I think at the core, uh, uh, Truett and his family and his partners believe in this idea of the golden rule, that what inspires them is to turn frowns into smiles, to take customers' problems and troubles and make them happy. And this love thy neighbor as the core. And, you know, I, I actually think over the years, I bet you more and more people at Chick-fil-A understand the golden rule the way I do. And, and so I'm proud to be associated with the company, but I, I, on that dimension, no one is more sensitive than, than I am with, with, with our two kids and, and both of them. No, I should say one of them eats there uh, and is happy. The other one is, is a vegetarian and, <laughs> and stays away. Uh, but, but this, the life lessons you learn, you know, nobody is the same. No one believes exactly the same things, but wow, have I learned from Chick-fil-A that loving your teammates and putting your store operator in a position, a frontline leader in a position to do great things with their teams for their customers, and then sharing the recognition and reward. I mean, Chick-fil-A store operators can earn hundreds of thousands of dollars because Chick-fil-A doesn't think of its job. Truett Cathy didn't think of his job as getting rich. His job was to help his partners prosper and enrich the lives they touch and, and enjoy some of the fruits of, of that achievement. And, and when you do it right, the economics are astonishing. That, that's why people, as you should have mentioned with Andy Taylor, he had a thick binder uh, on the shelf behind his desk, said, Andy, what is that? He said, that's the list of all of the people in Enterprise Rent-A-Car who earn over $200,000 a year. And that made him proud. That wasn't a cost reduction concern. And the same thing at Chick-fil-A. They're proud of how many store operators can earn hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes a million, over a million. And and celebrate that. And, and it shows this economic reality of when I inspire my frontline troops to love their customers and enrich their lives, the economic flywheel of customers coming back for more and bringing their friends is unbelievably powerful. Fred, you have four decades of being obsessed with this topic. I mean, you have far exceeded the quote 10,000 hour rule that <laughs> Jeff Colvin and others, and Mark and Gladwell, Malcolm Gladwell, you know, popularized. In a moment, I'm gonna ask you just to kind of riff on insights that you've learned around customer loyalty and being obsessed with a client-centered mind. Before I go there, 
I'd like to have you share one of the stories in the book about Amazon. You know, everybody loves to hate Amazon and everybody loves to own their stock, right? It's kind of one of the most interesting dichotomies. You share a story about, I think, your son and a, and a holiday gift or a moving gift he was buying for a colleague, and then you back it up into another story about your own experience at Amazon and a movie rental. Would you describe both those stories separately? And what is the insight for every business unit leader listening today that they should be replicating in their organization? Sure. The, 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 those stories, by the way, are in a chapter in Winning on Purpose called Be Remarkable. And, uh, and that's the right goal. You have to be, you have to wow a customer. You have to innovate and, and, and do something that is noteworthy. And in my case, I've seen, uh, I've seen Amazon get, I think, partly for good reasons, but a lot of bad, inappropriate reasons. People are hating on Amazon. When Amazon is committed to, to doing remarkable things for customers and making their lives better. And, and I, in my own personal life, I just share a couple of examples. My, my son, who worked at Apple, has worked at Apple over 10 years, uh, married a, a, a young woman from that same store. So we're an Apple family. He, I was looking for Apple stories for the book over Christmas when I, we were visiting him. And he said, no, I'll tell you an, Am an Amazon story because I, I bought a... Uh, an ex a gift. It was we shared. It was a shared expense for some of our teammates, and uh, and the gift didn't show up for this employee who was being transferred to the Middle East with a, an, app, an Apple store over there. And so we called Amazon to find out what had happened, and, and it turned out that they had sent it to the wrong address. And he, and he recognized it was his mistake. He'd given Amazon uh, the wrong number. And then the the lady on the other on the phone said, "Well, well, that's our fault. As I look at the records." That, that, that address doesn't exist. We should have caught that for you. So you give me the correct number and we'll send it to, uh, we'll get that expensive camera to him um, before he leaves on our nickel. And, you know, my son is just blown away. How, how can a company with razor narrow margins be so generous uh, when they make a mistake? Well, then uh, uh, I had a similar experience that, that it made me think of. I, I'd uh, got a movie rental charge on my bill that I didn't recognize. So I challenged it. And the person who I got to finally on the phone said, well, we're happy to take it off your bill, Mr. Reichelt, of course. Um, but just, just in case this is helpful to you, the, the, the kind of TV that was rented on is a pro scan something or other. I can't remember the number, but I said, oh, oh, I have one of those at my rental house. I better go check. And sure enough, somebody had rented a movie on my account and forgot to tell me. So I called back Amazon the next day and I said, oh, my fault. I apologize. Put that back on my bill. The lady says, oh, just that's fine. This, it's too hard to do that. It's com complicated. Just that's you're a great customer. and Thank you for your business. So how do you do that? How do you love customers and be remarkable? Well, first of all, you recognize when you're face to face or phone phone with a customer, don't just waste that with satisfying them or getting the job done. Do something that wows them because you've invested a lot of money in that already. Make sure it's a huge grand, grand slam success. And then I learned something. They don't do that for everybody. They keep track of their customers. And if you if you buy stuff from them and don't return lots of things and no shady things about <laughs> not paying your bills, they keep track. And then you're on their list of when that guy calls in, find something special and kind that you can do that feels appropriate to him, but just is an act of love. Fred, to the extent we are in a post-pandemic world, that's of course debatable at the time of this release, uh, I've heard this adage that you know every company is now a technology company and every company is now in the same business, they're in the people business, they're in the relationship business. For those organizations that are now uh, much more digitally oriented, their customer experience is more digital, whether they're training, delivering you know, leadership development solutions like Franklin Covey is, is it more difficult to create um, a winning strategy with your clients when perhaps some disproportionate amount of your experience is now in a digital environment? What would you say to leaders who say, yeah, that's not as important anymore because it's now an efficiency process or it's how fast we can get them in and out? Mm. What would you say to that conundrum? Uh, I've heard that argument, and I'll even go further and say that, gosh, now that we don't have frontline employee humans dealing with our customers, now we have bots and digital uh, algorithms. 
loyalty is less relevant. I, and I think, oh my goodness, that, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. This world of digital is open up, opening up so many opportunities to do wonderful things for your customers, to communicate more effectively, to, to much more scientifically gather feedback and spread it in real time to everyone in the organization who should be learning from this feedback. Uh, this is, the digital era is, is the era of, of net promoter. Uh, just just watch the companies who are superstars on this, whether it's Chewy and Pet Food or uh, Peloton, Warby Parker, a heavy NPS practitioner, they're using the NPS philosophy and framework and tools and digitizing them in such cool ways. And in the case of, of Warby, they were one of the, uh, the, the leading edge pioneers of, of experimenting with, with earned growth, which is this accounting metric I developed as a balance to the survey-based net promoter score. So now we need an accounting metric to hold people accountable to. You get rid of this begging and pleading on scores, but how do we hold people accountable? Well, you measure how much revenue is coming from customers coming back for more and bringing their friends. And at Warby, they measure that earned growth. You know, bought growth is expensive. It rarely turns out to be a good investment. Earned growth is referral driven, delighting customers, remarkable. And at Warby, they found that 90% of their new customers were coming primarily as a result of referrals and recommendations. Think of that, a digital company primarily, of course they have some stores, but they're generating such enthusiasm in their people that they're, they're getting 90% of their growth free. <laughs> no, no marketing and sales and advertising expense. And of course, how do they do that? Well, they're innovative. They design the customer experience very thoughtfully but they do more. If you, get a, if you read their uh, invoice when it comes to you, I buy glasses from them. They, uh, they say, we're, we're buying a, a brand new pair of prescription glasses for people in need. And you, as a customer, I think, gee, that's nice. And then I forget about it. But their employees know that. Their employees are the ones that allocate those free uh, glasses to people who are, are sight impaired and can't go to school and learn or can't do their job. So the the purpose of enriching the lives they touch is being unleashed by customer loyalty and the economic advantage. But I think the benefits of that higher purpose is inspiring the employee teams. And that's how a company like Warby can attract all of this young, energetic, digitally savvy talent, which is in such short supply during the great resignation. Um, how are you going to compete in this world if you can't attract digital talent into your business to to show the love to your customers. And that's the cycle we're in. And so I think uh, good luck to those people that, who, who think they can pull the di digital success off without a net promoter philosophy behind it. Fred, the book is winning on purpose. Fast forward five years. Um, AI will be ubiquitous. Machine learning will be probably part of any organization that's a global company or looking to create efficiencies. Those organizations that are winning who are they and what are they doing differently? Well, winning to me happens on very many levels. Um, I think we, took, we think way too much about financial winning today when in fact that's a second or third order effect of winning when it comes to leaders building communities based on golden rule behaviors where teammate, teams are inspired to, to love their customers. That's how we should measure winning. And, and the, the metrics we need to pay more attention to are you know, how likely you'd recommend your team as a great place to work. How, where are we not living up to golden rule standards in our internal processes and procedures and what needs to change? Um, where are we doing things to customers that, that make you cringe and, and don't feel like they are uh, up to the standard of loving care? And, and talk about those at least as frequently, if not more frequently than the financial metrics that I think now drive so much of our thinking. Our governance is driven by financial metrics. Our investors demand financial metrics. We set budgets, we, we pay bonuses. We have to get it balanced. So in five years, I hope that every company, you know, if we have two thirds of the world using Net Promoter and supposedly using it, I hope that at least that fraction uses earned growth and that metrics of success signals that we are loving our customers. And that is the evidence of winning. And the evidence of winning with our teams is they're inspired and they, they do remarkable things for customers. Yes, they're financially well rewarded. A lots of them want to stay and, and, and be promoted in this company, but they all are recommending this as a great place to work. Maybe not for your whole career, 
But when your people are saying, you know, they give a 10 on how likely it's this is a great team. And this is a question we ask at Bain. Uh, it, we, um, you know, I'll, I'll toot our horn. I'm only halftime Bain for the last 25 years. So this is the non-Bain half. You can trust it um, in, in, in praising some of the things we do. Bain has been the best place to work, according to Glassdoor, for most of the last decade. It's an astonishing success for a company that was almost bankrupt in the 1990s um, and fell apart based on, I think, values. We figured out how important values are. And I think some of the things we do inside Bain are people-oriented, team-oriented, and they reflect, uh, customers feel them in a different way. But we ask our teams every six months, how likely you'd recommend your team? How much, you know, how much do you wanna work with this same leader again? And we've built this into how we drive promotions, um, who, who the leaders are at Bain is based on helping their teams earn lives of meaning and purpose. So we ask, you know, do you, how do you, do you agree that you're, you feel like you're playing a valued role on a team that wins with its customers? That's the core to winning. And, and that's my hope in five years that more and more companies will understand that's how we define success. That would, that's what it means to win and, and how, how we enrich a life. And of course, you know, I invest in these companies with the highest net promoter score. I understand how it cycles in. When customers come back from one and bring their friends, it makes people rich. And my investment track record in putting money into those companies, I've more than tripled the stock market over the last decade. That reality for investors is, is getting better and better understood. I hope it's universally understood eventually. Fred, let's end with this. Um, there is not a CEO or board member in the world that does not know who Fred Reichheld is, who has not read your books, your many books around customer loyalty. You are a New York Times bestselling author. You are the inventor of the Net Promoter System methodology and score. Your new book is Winning on Purpose. Uh, you've been given in some ways a gift, and that is you, were, you, were, you faced mortality in the last several years with this cancer diagnosis. You were presented with all the, the survivability curves and you decided to write this book to kind of encapsulate your final knowledge. What do you think, with all humility, what do you think your biggest contribution, perhaps beyond your family and your family legacy, what is your biggest contribution? What would you like it to be to organizations through your work? Well, I hope leaders have a clearer understanding of greatness. I think Jim Collins did the world a favor with his book, but I think there's more. I think there is a deeper purpose. Um, you know, I talked a little bit about Enterprise Rent-A-Car and Chick-fil-A and USAA, and in the book you'll see Vanguard and Intuit as well. This is a philosophy of, of how I can help my people lead lives of meaning and purpose and embrace a mission of enriching customer lives. That I hope that that is no longer just a fuzzy statement, but actually finds its way into the measurement and control systems of businesses. And, you know, I, this book was dedicated to my granddaughters, I, who are infants. I hope they read it and they see that this is a philosophy that helps you spend your time on earth with the right people. Back to Bob Harry's investing in the right relationships. When you find good people who are making the world a better place and are embodying the principles you, you care about, invest, spend time with them, help them succeed. So whether you're a customer choosing a company, you know, pick the companies that love their customers and, and the evidence in NPS and earned growth will make that clear over time. If you're an employee thinking about your next job, go work with a company who lives this philosophy. Your life will be better and you'll have a better impact. And for heaven's sakes, as an investor, um, take this into account because you'll be able to pick the companies that are going to prosper and, and return uh, better financial results. So where today we measure greatness with a financial mindset, I hope we measure greatness with a, a human mindset and can put some, uh, some metrics behind that. Fred Reichheld, such an honor to be in your presence today. The new book is Winning on Purpose. We wish your launch great success, perhaps as important. We wish your own health great success as well. Thanks for your time today. My pleasure, Scott. Thanks for joining us. If you're not subscribing to On Leadership, you can do so on all your favorite or any of your favorite podcast platforms, or you can visit franklincovey.com. Click on the On Leadership button. 
On Leadership comes out every Tuesday morning in both an email and podcast format. It includes a blog from me as well as a downloadable tool from Franklin Covey's Leadership Toolkit. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership.